All right, you're unmuted and everything, Dr. Wakamoto. Um, you should be able to share your screen when you get a chance. Okay, is my camera on? Uh, so Maybe far, I don't, I don't see it. Maybe I don't need it, but let me see. Now we see your one screen now, and you don't have to worry about your camera. We haven't been using those today, so. Okay. How's that? Perfect. See it? It's, it's got the screen. We can hear you loud and clear. Um, no. Want me to just get started? Yeah, let's go ahead. Everyone's on, so let's, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, well, it's uh, so wonderful to be here. I, I, I thank uh, Jeremy for inviting me. I think it's the first time I've been to the High Plains Conference, so it's a, a unique experience. I wish I could be there in person, but as you all know, what, what we're struggling with. So what I'm going to be talking about today is one of my favorite subjects, and, and it's great when I get the chance to talk about research because I have a day job that's all-consuming. But I'll talk about tornadoes, and, and actually, I have two parts. One is to talk about the, the lofted debris cloud that surrounds the funnel. Then I have a second aspect that I'd like to touch on, and that's the uh, cycloidal damage swaths that are often doc documented at, at the surface. I do have uh, collaborators, uh, Zach Wienhoff, Howie Bluestein, and Dylan Reef at the University of Oklahoma, and uh, Dave Llewellyn from West Virginia University. Oops, am I? Here we go. So I, you've seen many movies like this, uh, the loft of debris swirling around in the top left. This is a, a video I remember Chuck Doswell took where, I mean, this is really large debris. I, I remember this video also shows uh, trailers and, and I think even automobiles being lofted. It, this was just an incredibly strong tornado. And then the one on the bottom is uh, one without large debris but dust or sand being kicked up. You know, lofted debris is a common feature of many tornadoes, yet very little is known about the debris characteristics and its impact on tornado dynamics. And I'm not going to talk about its impact on tornado dynamics, but I know in recent years we are starting to get a little bit more insight on the debris characteristics, and that, that's going to be the focus of my first part of my presentation. So this is just to show you what you already know. These debris clouds, lofted debris clouds, come in all kinds of shapes and sizes, and in some instances, I would argue they're more spectacular than the funnel uh, themselves. So the data that I'm going to be showing for actually both parts of my uh, presentation were collected by RACS. Uh, that's you know that's quite an acronym, acronym, but it stands for the Rapidly Scanning X-Band Polar Metric Radar. Um, you know the X part is easy to understand because you can see below the wavelength is 3.1 centimeters and that puts it in the X-band uh, region of the electromagnetic spectrum. The beam width's one degree, and the, raz the azimuth of scan rate's uh, very impressive. It's 180 degrees per second, so you know, in two seconds it can do a full 360. Uh, the antenna's uh, 2.4 meters. You know, a typical volume scan, not the only one, but would be if you're interested in the lower levels. It'd be zero to six degrees in one degree steps, and, and you can do that in about 20 seconds. Before the rapid scan capability, you know, this could take about two minutes plus to complete. And I think, as you all know, with tornadoes, you want a rapid turnaround um, in terms of high-resolution temporal scale. Uh, this is an audience that I don't think I need to say much about a couple of the polar metric variables I'm going to talk about. I think this audience is well aware of the um, differential reflectivity. I think you already know, highlighted in blue there, that for debris, uh, the differential reflectivity is low, typically not close to zero, but low. This is really what I wanted to highlight. Uh, there have been slow but increasing reports of negative ZDR in lofted debris. And, and when this was first reported, people were sort of scratching their heads and saying, now why, why are we seeing negative ZDR in lofted debris? So that is uh, one of the aspects I'll be coming back to later. And again, cross-correlation coefficient of rho HV. This is not an audience that uh, needs me to talk about this much. And I think you're well aware that uh, it's a great variable when you're looking at lofted debris. Here's an example of a 
horizontal scan through lofted debris, and it just jumps out at you. The lower values of Rho HV um, are, are just hard to, to, to not see. Uh, they just jump out so, so prominently. Uh, oh, I use this just because I always like it. This is the El Reno tornado. I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's, uh, it was an incredible tornado in 2013, but it's a wonderful example of the characteristics of the TDS, the tornadic uh, vortex signature or debris signature. You can see the hook echo. You can see the incredible rotational couplet. Those range rings are every two kilometers. This rotational couplet was uh, not the largest I've ever seen, but pretty impressive. Uh, ZDR on the bottom left, you can see um, the relatively uh, circular region of low ZDR. But once again, when you when you look at Rho HV, it just jumps out at you. It's uh, Rho HV is the preferred variable. Oh, I have to thank Dylan Reef. Uh, he all the years I've been doing severe storm research. Finally, someone. Uh, took a picture of me with a tornado right there, and I'm actually taking a picture of that tornado. It is what I'm going to be talking about today. That's the Dodd City tornadoes of a few years ago. Um, by the way, if you look very carefully on the camera, you'll notice the orange light, which means I'm depressing the shutter. So I, I give Dylan Reef a score of 10 on 1 to 10 because he took this picture at exactly the right time. Uh, but this is what I use to introduce the subject of photogrammetry. And so here's a schematic to sort of talk about photogrammetry if, if you're unfamiliar with it. So effectively, I'm standing where the red star is. Uh, but that is also the location of Raxpole. That is the radar location. Uh, so basically, everything you're going to see in, photo, in terms of photographs I show you is basically photographing out to the west. There I've drawn just a, a generic hook echo with a weak echo hole. Uh, and then you can see the photograph that I've schematically shown there. So photogrammetry is nothing more than a snazzy word to say that I'm going to carefully put an azimuth and elevation angle on top of the uh, photograph. Many people know, don't know that you can do this, but if you can, uh, it allows you to use the picture in a much more quantitative manner rather than just very qualitatively. And you'll see examples of that. In addition, if I take a vertical cross-section like I'm showing you here through the hook echo, through the tornado, through the rotational couplet, uh, because uh, I told you earlier that, that I'm superimposing the elevation and azimuth angles on the photograph, because I'm at the radar site, those also represent the radar scanning angles. So then it is really easy to uh, superimpose the radar data right on top of the picture. Mm -hmm. And it really gives you a, a totally different perspective of radar and visual characteristics of the tornado. Seems like yesterday, but it's already been five years since the uh, Dodd City case. Uh, the, a number of very intense thunderstorms developed on this day. Uh, the circle represents where Dodd City is located. And you can see the storm, the anvil, actually isn't the most impressive anvil, but it is the most impressive supercell. Uh, tornadoes are actually occurring uh, at this time when the satellite image was uh, recorded. So I remember being exceedingly worried on this day because this is a picture I took out of the car. And you can see the uh, there's a tornado out there. And of course, we're not in place. You can see that Raxpole is driving down the inter not the highway. You can see rain or being uh, water on the ground being lofted behind the truck. And, and my greatest fear was, OK, we're going to get there, and the tornado is going to dissipate. So luckily, that fear dissipated, too, but I was very worried. Here is one of the reasons why you can see that I didn't need to be worried, because uh, you can see on the top left, it's labeled tornado number four. In other words, there was more than just one tornado. There's a whole series of tornadoes on this day. Uh, here are just three examples of pictures I took of tornado number four. You can see the funnel cloud just beginning to develop on the top left. You can see uh, a few minutes later, the tornado is quite impressive on the top right. And then just a couple minutes later, you can see the dust, which first started showing up on the top right, really starts enveloping the whole uh, tornado on the bottom left. I'm not going to say much about the radar images you're seeing on the bottom right, because you'll see more of them later. I do want to highlight that these pictures, these three pictures, and all the pictures I've shown you have been adjusted 
So they've either been enlarged or reduced so that the relative dimensions of the funnel are the same. Uh, this is really important because as I take pictures of the tornado in, suppose the, uh, I see in my photographs the funnel is becoming larger. Well, there are two reasons for that. One is it could be literally beginning getting larger. But there's also the possibility that the tornado is approaching the photographer. And so that's a false enlargement. So I want to negate that effect, and I can do that photogrammetrically. Um, Well, when there's a really good single tornado or a tornado outbreak, you'll normally see me do a fairly um, detailed damage survey, both ground and aerial. Uh, the aircraft I used on this day, is act this is actually the aircraft I used. It's a Cessna 172. Uh, and here's one of the uh, several images I'll show you. I, I, maybe you see the tornado track. I think it's pretty obvious, like highlighting it in light blue. One of the for fortunate things about the Dodge City tornadoes is, is they occur predominantly in open fields, going over wheat fields, dirt fields, grass fields. There was only one building that it, it actually made a direct hit on and, and just demolished it. And uh, nobody died, thank heavens, but the, there were some injuries. But other than that, it was this is very typical of where the tornadoes, uh, uh, the type of ground that they went over, just open areas, missing structures. There were structures there, but the tornado missed them. I'm showing you this because it, it's actually one of the more dramatic uh, photographs I've taken of the tornado track. I mean, it, you can anyone can see where the track is. In this case, it's core. The tornado core is about 80 meters in uh, diameter. It's just, in fact, when I first looked at it, I said, that can't be right. But then I realized, no, that is the tornado. Uh, let me sort of enlarge this section of the tornado. And um, one, it just shows you the detail uh, within this tornado track. But if you look very carefully, you start seeing the cycloidal swath mark, something I'm going to talk about uh, in the second half of my presentation. Oh, just another example. Uh, the image on left and right are exactly the same. All I've done on the right is highlight the track with the light blue line, but I probably didn't have to do that. I think you can see it on the left. Ten tornadoes occurred west of Dodge City, and here they all are. Since that image is a little small, I'm going to enlarge it and focus in on the area that is of most interest. Uh, very fortunate that it's west of Dodge City. If, if these tornadoes had gone through Dodge City, it would have been a very different story. There would have been quite a bit of devastation. Uh, notice uh, Raxpole, it set up at two locations, Site 1 and Site 2. All the data I'll be showing you was collected at Site 1. Uh, the first part of my presentation, I'm going to focus in on tornado number four, and that's the reason why I highlighted it in red. Uh, later on, I am going to be talking about tornado number one, and that's the tornado on the bottom left. Blue circles represent times. That's where the tornado is located um, based on where the rotational couplet was, uh, was located. Um, the other thing, if you look carefully at the times, which are listed next to the circle, for example, this one around 2330, if you believe all that, you would say, gee, there's more than one tornado on the ground at the same time. So actually, let me show you this one around 2330. Uh, this is a picture I took, and you can see tornado four on the left, but also note there's tornado five on the right. Uh, there were numerous times on this day where you actually could take more than one tornado um, simultaneously on the ground. So as I mentioned, the first tornado I was going to focus in on was tornado number four. So this is the track, tornado four, from the beginning to about halfway down the track. Again, I don't want you to uh, lose sight of the details, so let me enlarge part of it. What do I want to highlight? First, the brown lines, the dashed lines. Those are the fields, and but more importantly, notice I've listed, uh, labeled on here, the field characteristics. I'm going to present to you um, the lofted debris cloud. I think you'd like to know what's being lofted. Well, I can tell you that because of the aerial survey. I know exactly what the, uh, as of that day, what the field characteristics were. The red line represents the tornado track. Uh, the circles represent the location of the tornado. I've got the timestamps next to the circles. Uh, what else? I have a blue arrow there that represents the time I'm going to show you. It's point, what, pointing to 23, 30, 29. And then the thin black lines, those are the azimuth and range rings from Roxpole. I think that's all I wanted to mention on this slide. So let's look at where that blue arrow is pointed. 
this is 23, 30, 33, beautiful hook echo with a weak echo eye, well-defined rotational couplet, and at this time, a, a very well-developed uh, row HV minimum. And of course, there is also a ZDR, uh, low ZDR values. One of the things I'll add, though, is this tiny red circle. And so what is that? Well, you can see the label. That's actually the funnel diameter. Uh, the funnel diameter I determined photogrammetrically. Of course, the radar, at least the, the radars we use, uh, does not uh, resolve the funnel diameter. So I have to actually calculate this using photogrammetry. But I'm, I do this because I'm always fascinated by the size of the tornado funnel in relation to the radar signature. In this case, the tornado at this time is pretty small compared to the rotational couplet, the debris cloud, even the hook echo. So that's really the point of why I did this. And I think you know about this donut-shaped configuration of relatively uh, high echo here. Uh, it's, it's been hypothesized that that's the debris ring. So here is the photograph of the tornado at this time. Uh, it's pretty well developed. Uh, you notice that I performed a photogrammetric analysis because I've got the elevation and azimuth grid on top of it. Remember, I'm essentially standing at the radar site, so these also represent the radar scanning angles. It is then pretty easy to do a vertical cross-section, in this case of radar reflectivity, through the center of the tornado and actually plot it accurately on this photograph. Shaded blue is less than 20 dBZ, so where the tornado is, you see what WEC means, the weak echo column. Uh, and of course, it's pretty much centered on the tornado. But it's giving you a better view of the relationship with this weak echo column and the visible tornado. Notice also the, these areas at low levels of the higher reflectivity. That's that donut-shaped high reflectivity or tube-shaped tube high reflectivity ring, which is the debris ring. Uh, let me show you Doppler velocities. Uh, the green represents velocities away from the radar. The red represents velocities toward the radar. Shaded green and shaded red are velocities greater than 50 meters per second. Uh, and by the way, the green literally represents velocities into the picture, and red represents velocities out of the picture. Uh, and that is the correct interpretation if the photogrammetry is done correctly. So here you're getting a, uh, a depiction of the vertical cross-section of the rotational couplet and its relationship uh, with the tornado, a view that you don't often see. And now this is maybe the first time you've ever seen something like this. This is now the vertical cross-section of cross-correlation coefficient of rho HV uh, through the tornado. So first off, I'm, uh, you can see that there's a gen in general, there's a column of low row HV. The shaded red is less than 0.4, so that's the very low values. But, but backing off, there's just a column of low row HV. One of the things I want to highlight is that visually you don't see debris, but the cross-correlation coefficient is telling you there is debris there. It's just uh, not de being detected by your eye. The other thing that I think is important to mention is if you look at the areas of the lowest row HV, which is shaded, uh, you'll notice that from about the middle of the tornado and above, the minimum is like smack on the funnel. But if you go look below that, uh, notice that the low row HV is actually outside the funnel. It's, it's, it's actually um, forms a ring, actually, of low row HV. Now, now, I hope this isn't too confusing, but I wanted to superimpose the radar echoes and the row HV on top of each other. And basically, you see this uh, match of strong echo and minimum row HV. So this is telling us this is also the area of not only is it a debris ring, but it is the area of high debris loading, which has only been shown in simulations. This is probably one of the few times it's been shown very clearly in uh, radar data. Uh, and be clear about this high debris loading. And, and one of the ways to be clear about why this is occurring outside of the funnel is, is I'll go to Dave Llewellyn and who I think does the most spectacular tornado simulations out there. Uh, here you can see uh, he's done a simulation where the tornado is, is translating on a sand surface and you're just seeing snapshots at different time and his simulations produce debris clouds that are so realistic and look very much like the kinds that people take photographs of. Here's another part of his simulations where he was looking at sensitivity using different size particles 
On the left is sand particles that are 2 meters in diameter, and then on the right, sand particles that are only 0.5 millimeters. And you can see that, uh, I think it's intuitively obvious, the small sand particles produce a, just a much more uh, dramatic debris cloud that rises to a higher level. But one of the things I want to show from Llewellyn's study is he did azimuthal averages around the tornado of debris loading. So this is a vertical cross-section, and it's height versus range. The zero is the tornado center, and this is an azimuthal average of debris loading, which is shown in blue. Uh, red shading, by the way, is where the strongest azimuthal rotation is. And of course, you can see where the minimum or the maximum of debris loading is located. And it's not at the tornado center. It's off-axis. Now, physically, this is really easy to understand because um, there is centrifuging going on because the tornado is rotating so rapidly, so debris is being centrifuged out. But it eventually runs into, away from the tornado axis, it eventually ro uh, runs into the inflow into the tornado. And so this produces a sort of a convergence zone where debris just starts congregating, and that's what produces this max debris loading at the location that you see here. So here's a few minutes later. Uh, the tornado is very impressive, tornado number four. It's now about a couple hundred meters in diameter, and dust now is beginning to rise up from the ground. Here's the radar reflectivity cross-section through the tornado. Again, shaded blue is less than 20, uh, centered right on the tornado funnel. But now even more prominently, notice the high reflectivity regions just at low levels. And in fact, these high reflectivity regions uh, match pretty well with the dust that you see now visually being kicked up by the tornado. Let me show it to you in a different way, uh, this analysis I just presented. Uh, here's the hook echo, and, and actually you've seen this hook echo before. This is what the hook echo was. All I did was rotate it and enlarge it. You'll see why I did this in just a second. And then you see the black line, which is where the vertical cross-section is. Uh, this is the vertical cross-section, the one I just presented to you. But I'm doing this in a very special way. I've aligned the viewing angles. So in other words, here's 300-degree azimuth. Well, there's 300-degree azimuth, too. So I've aligned the viewing angle. And the length scales are the same. In other words, the length scale here is exactly the same as the length scale here at the distance of the tornado. So if I do this correctly, uh, I, I, this is literally the way this tornado and the funnel fits into this hook echo. So once again, you're getting an example of the size of the tornado and actually how it relates uh, in size physically to the hook echo radar signature. It's, it's a view that is rarely shown, but I think you, you can learn a lot from that. And now here's the vertical cross-section of Rho HV. Maybe more prominently now, you see this minimum of Rho HV because the shaded red is less than 0.4 centered more or less on the tornado. But once again, notice uh, at the lowest levels, it's different. The, the really low values of Rho-HV are outside of the funnel. Uh, and once again, more or less centered right on the visible uh, dust that's being kicked up at low levels. In between those two areas, the Rho-HV is actually higher because it's not shaded. And now here's my first uh, presentation and maybe your first view ever of a vertical correction of ZDR through a tornado. So green represents positive ZDR. Uh, shaded green is greater than plus 3 dB. So uh, basically these shaded regions are large raindrops. But the red areas that are centered on the tornado, uh, that is negative ZDR. And the shaded red is actually less than minus 3 dB. So this is really low ZDR, it's low negative ZDR, it's pretty much centered on the tornado, it's a very coherent feature, um, and it shows up as a column. So this is not just a, some sort of spurious thing that you see at one elevation angle, in this case it's very coherent at all elevation angles. So what's going on, and why is it centered on the tornado? So it turns out while I was doing this analysis, the people at Oklahoma were doing what they called a polarimetric radar simulator. And it's actually just what it says. It's a radar simulator that simulates a polarimetric characteristics of what you should see if you had a radar scanning, scanning the tornado in this case. So this is a vertical cross-section you can see. You can basically interpret the blue as uh, the tornado funnel. Uh, but at the bottom, notice all these colored red. Uh, that's debris that they've released into the tornado. 
Uh, not only that, the red color tells you that it's negative ZDR. Um, they say the reason why it's negative ZDR is there's common debris alignment. And finally, what did they release into this tornado? In the simulator, they released leaves. So what is going on? And so negative ZDR, is, as we're beginning to find out, is not so uncommon. Uh, what it means is, and this is what they talk about, is that the lofted leaves are doing this. They're actually oriented vertically. And of course, if they orient vertically, you get more return vertically polarized than horizontally polarized. So that, yeah, this will give you a negative ZDR. So moving back to this Dodge City tornado number four, I, I want to just jump to my schematic model. There's a lot in the schematic model. I just want to highlight two things. One is the black box in the center of the tornado, which I'm enlarging to, on the right. You can see I have debris particles, which are colored red. But I also have these green lines up and down. So what is that? Well, that's actually wheat stems, and I'm purposely orienting them vertically because I think that's what's going on. There's common debris alignment occurring. Now, why did I think these are wheat stems? Because once again, remember, I'm doing the survey, and this is the track of Tornado 4, which I think you see the track. And, and basically, this tornado went over wheat fields and dirt fields. So there's no question that this tornado ripped up a lot of wheat stems and, el and lofted them up in the tornado. And given the negative ZDR, given the radar polar metric simulator, uh, these to, this, uh, wheat stems are obviously oriented vertically. It's kind of amazing. I never would have guessed that ahead of time. So this is what I'm saying with the first bullet here. Uh, in the weak echo column, you see wheat stems that are vertically uh, oriented. Uh, the second thing is uh, I talk about these, this area of uh, max debris loading at low levels, which shows up on the schematic as these big red debris particles that I have highlighted, and also the arrow that says high debris loading. So that's the conclusion of my first story, part one. And now I'd like to skip over to the second part of my story, and that's cyclotodebris debris marks, which I've often thought about. And I can't introduce the subject without talking about Ted Fujita. And of course, you know that um, uh, he was known as Mr. Tornado. Uh, and two reasons for that, not only because he contributed so much for our understanding of tornadoes, but if you knew him personally, and I'm going to guess a few people maybe in the audience uh, had the pleasure of meeting him or seeing him make a presentation. But it also does a wonderful job of explaining his personality. He was sort of a whirlwind of activity. Uh, just three bullets of some of uh, just a long list of his accomplishments. I think you all know he developed the F scale, the Fujita scale. Uh, it's a damage intensity scale. It's not a wind scale, which is often the misconception about the F scale. And of course, you know, it's been modified to EF scale. And there's actually a story about that that I was involved with. I'm happy to answer, uh, answer what story goes with that if someone is interested at the end of the seminar. Uh, of course, you all know he discovered the microburst phenomenon uh, the wind shear event, and, and I really want to emphasize, if he hadn't done that, and had he not contributed to improved pilot training, uh, I think thousands and thousands of more people would have died in these aircraft accidents. So we really owe him a great deal uh, to that. And then for this presentation, he elevated damage surveys to just another level. Uh, I mean, uh, just an order of magnitude improvement of damage surveys in the aftermath of tornadoes. So uh, with that little bit of a segue, which I think is still important because Fujita will come back in my presentation, uh, we've known, even before Fujita became involved in severe storm re research, it's been well documented that in the aftermath of tornadoes, we see cycloidal, sometimes see cycloidal damage tracks, as you see here. And of course, it does tell you a lot. Um, it tells you the width of the tornado core, as I'm showing you with the dashed white lines. But it also tells you the tornado movement, if you know which way the tornado is rotating. So if you knew the tornado was rotating cyclonically, I can tell you right now there's no question the tornado is moving left or right, even if you never saw the tornado. Uh, that's what the damage survey is telling you. And in case you're having a little trouble seeing the cycloidal swath marks here, I've highlighted in yellow uh, what they look like. Um, and I often tell people, you know, this is no different than the kid's game spirograph, right, the little wheel with the hole in it. You put the pen in, and as the wheel goes along, you make these sort of marks. They're actually called trochoidal marks. But for the purpose of this talk, I'll just call them cycloidal marks. 
Now, the prevailing theory before Fujita's surveys in the 70s that these were damage swaths were actually gouge marks or scratch marks. Um, actually, that wasn't a bad guess, that basically debris was being caught up in the tornado and it was just gouging the ground. Well, one of Fujita's great contributions was he said, well, wait a minute, uh, based on my area surveys and ground surveys, this doesn't make sense. And so how did he come to this conclusion? Well, here's pictures that he took of, uh, you can see the cycloidal swath marks on the top left. And all I've done on the bottom, it's the same picture, but I've, I've highlighted with yellow lines those cycloidal swath marks in case you can't see them. And then in a very famous study, Fujita went down to the ground and said, well, wait a minute, these are not gouge marks. If you look very carefully at one of these marks, this is uh, an area where um, debris is being collected. And he, he actually said by some sort of suction process. You, in this case, this was corn stubble. And you can see all of the corn stubble has been collected in a line. And that's what's producing the cycloidal swath mark. Now, he, he did this, and it was I think it was pretty obvious, but he did a, another thing that was a monumental leap, and it's just the way Fujita's mind worked. He said, okay, here are these cycloidal damage tracks. Uh, I've shown that actually these are not gouge marks. These are areas where debris, these are debris lines, basically. And there's some, some, some sort of suction process that's putting together the debris in this line. So from this, and without visual evidence of tornadoes, he came up with this really famous model. But I want to emphasize that this was really absent visual, visual documentation. And there are two parts of his model. One that uh, he called them suction vortices, that tornadoes could break down into these multiple vortices all rotating around a common core. And, and you guys all know this. But he also had a second part of this model, that these suction vortices were creating these cycloidal debris swaths. Uh, maybe you didn't know that at the time he did this, because this model shown here is, 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 is in so many textbooks, I, I've lost count. But I want to remind you that there was enormous pushback by the severe storms community when he presented this model. Because surprisingly, even though he, he came up with this model in the 70s, and remember, people have taken pictures of tornadoes well before the 70s. But for whatever reason, there, are, there were no known documented photographs that actually showed this multiple vortex phenomena. So, uh, you know, people in the severe storms community uh, actually said, you know, this is malarkey. This doesn't happen. And, and the main reason they criticized Fujita was, if it does happen, show me a picture. Well, Fujita didn't have any pictures. But he still stood by this model. So again, for those who don't know the history, this is literally the way it was playing out. But you all know the end of the story. By the mid-70s, and it was about the mid-70s, suddenly, all these photographs and videos showed this multiple vortex or suction vortex phenomena. Whether it's the movie on the bottom left by Reed Timmer or whether it's a photograph, I think it was by Floyd Stiles of the Wichita Falls tornado, it, it became, the evidence became overwhelming that this multiple vortex uh, phenomena occurred. So Fujita felt vindicated, uh, which was wonderful. And Fujita did tend to, uh, oh, he, he tended to stretch his theories a little bit. Time usually uh, proved him right in many of the hypotheses he came up with. But there's one aspect of, uh, of, that I wanted to revisit. Not, not the suction vortice or the, the multiple vortex phenomena. There was something that always troubled me a little bit about the cycloidal damage swaths at the surface. And so even though this has been an accepted model for 50 years, I wanted to revisit it. By the way, before I go on to the analysis of Dodd City, one of the questions you might ask, well, you mean that Gouge marks never occur that show up as cycloidal damage marks. Well, I don't want to leave you with that opinion. On the top are cycloidal debris swaths, very similar to what I showed you earlier. So these are debris lines. But on the bottom are actually gouge marks. And let me highlight for both top and bottom images what they look like. Uh, the gouge marks on the bottom look beautiful. I mean, they're beautiful cycloidal marks. Uh, but there is one subtle thing that I want to point out, that it's not continuous. And actually, when I think about it, that makes sense to me. If something's being picked up, like, I don't know, some big 2 by 4 or maybe 4 by 4 picked up by a train, and it's actually being dragged along the line, I actually would expect it to sort of skip a little bit, you know, maybe make contact with the ground, may go up in the tornado, or tumble a little bit. And so the fact that you see sporadic gouge marks makes sense to me. But anyway, I wanted to answer the question that, yes, you do see gouge marks. Yes, they sometimes produce cycloto marks, but they are not that common. The top photograph is much more common. 
So the Dodge City outbreak did provide an opportunity to revisit Fujita's model. Maybe somewhat surprisingly if I, that I make this statement, this is the first time that mobile radar data, video and pictures, and a damage survey that confirmed the existence of cycloidal debris plots has been simultaneously collected. It's just never happened before. And I know with all the mobile radar platforms out there, all the pictures people take, and all the surveys people make, you, you would have thought that it all would have come together previously. But no, Dot City was the first time this ever occurred. And these are examples of the kinds of cycloidal swath marks that uh, actually Tornado 1 produced in dirt fields. I think you see them pretty uh, prominently. Uh, the white box on the left is the area that I'm really going to focus in on. Uh, this is Tornado 1. Uh, you can see uh, it's labeled, and Tornado 4, of course, is in the top uh, middle of this figure. So you've already seen my analysis of Tornado 4. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that all of the analysis uh, in the area that I'm looking at is basically due west of where Rack's Pole is located. So this is the white box that I'm showing you here. It's enlarged. Uh, and even though it's enlarged, I want to enlarge it even more so you really can see the details. OK, so uh, let's see. The gray thin lines are the range and azimuth lines. Uh, I think you can see that. And notice there's a 270 degrees. I told you it was due west. Uh, the brown lines and the dashed lines, those are the dirt fields, or those are the fields. And not surprisingly, it's all dirt, uh, because that uh, these kind of cyclotomarks marks typically occur most prominently in dirt fields. And that's what tornado went through in this air general area. The red line is the tornado track. Uh, the blue circles are the location of the tornado with time stamps. Uh, the magenta circles, those, that's actually the funnel diameter. Uh, that was determined photogrammetrically. Again, the radar can't tell you the photo uh, funnel diameter. Uh, green lines, you see there are a few green lines in there. That's the twisted irrigation pipes. I mean, it just mangled these irrigation pipes. Uh, I decided to plot the exact locations. Uh, and then, most importantly, are the white uh, semicircular lines. Those are the cycloidal debris swaths, uh, and they are accurately plotted. This is not an estimate, and I'm not just plotting lines arbitrarily. Uh, each one of these swaths are very accurately plotted on this figure. Here's an example of, uh, with a little bit more analysis there. On the top, you see the cycloidal swath marks. You see the red line, which is the tornado path. The blue circles represent the location of the tornado at those times. And again, to help you out on the bottom, I have uh, put yellow uh, lines to highlight the numerous numbers of cycloidal swath marks um, that occurred on the top figure. And then the white line, and, and if you don't like the white line, just look at the top figure. You can see what I mean by these mangled uh, irrigation pipes. I'm not going to talk about the black circles. Um, it's an interesting story there, but for this talk, I think I'm skipping that. So this is, again, the same box you saw earlier. Uh, the only difference, instead of a red line, the tornado track is a white line. And instead of white semicircular uh, marks, I, I highlighted them in black. But you can see the cycloidal uh, damage squats. On the left, I just superimposed very carefully the radar reflectivity. Notice you see the uh, circular uh, uh, debris ring. Perhaps not as uh, dramatic as, as the earlier part of my talk, but it's there. And there's a weak echo region right in the middle of it that's centered on the tornado track. I should mention what the blue circle is, the much larger blue circle. That's uh, the visible debris cloud. So this has been determined photogrammetrically. Uh, I'm not showing it to you, um, although I have the slide somewhere. It, it matches perfectly with the uh, low row HV area. So it's, a, it's an example of the debris cloud matching the region of low row HV. And on the right, you see the uh, Doppler velocity. So there's a prominent rotational couplet associated with the tornado, you know, pretty much centered on the tornado track. So here is tornado one. This is exactly the time that, uh, you know, all those cycloidal swath marks are occurring. So this tornado at this time it's being photographed is producing those marks. And by the way, you can see photogrammetrically, I've determined the, the width of the dust cloud. It's about a, uh, uh, what is it, uh, about a kilometer wide, uh, maybe a little bit larger than that, because I have the scale on the top, top left. 
So I want to now go back to Dave Llewellyn's simulations. Uh, the top three pictures you've already seen. Uh, that was an example of the tornado moving over the sand field and slowly lofting the sand. What I prefer to focus in on is the bottom. That's a simulated, basically, damage track by Dave Llewellyn. And so what is it showing? The gray areas are areas where dust or sand have been removed. And the black lines are where debris has been deposited. And right away, I think you can see uh, the cycloidal debris swaths. They really are prominent in Llewellyn's model uh, simulation. In fact, uh, uh, on the bottom is one of Dave Llewellyn's simulations. I chose this one because the parameters of the simulation are pretty close to the Dodd City case. But let me start at the top. There are those cycloidal uh, swath marks. Uh, but first off, I want to highlight that 270 meter uh, diameter region, that width. Why am I highlighting that? And what do the dashed blue lines represent? Well, if you look very carefully, you'll notice that the, this, it's light brown here and it's dark brown here. Uh, there's a reason for that. Um, the light brown area is where dirt has been removed by the tornado. And it's well known that this dirt is removed in, in a region much larger than the tornado core. And, it's, and it's, it's probably one of the best examples of an aerial survey photograph that illustrates this. You can see the tornado core in the middle of the picture, but this where dirt is being removed is much larger. And it's occurring over a width of 270 meters. Now what I did was simply superimpose those dashed blue lines on the photograph below. Uh, and what do you see below in Llewellyn's simulation? The blues and the greens are where dirt is being removed. And the yellows and the reds are where debris is being deposited. Uh, I was sort of uh, struck by how similar the observations match the simulation. Uh, because I just transposed those light blue lines onto his simulation. And there's a pretty close match. But now let me focus in on the swath marks. You, you can see in Dave Llewellyn's simulations, they're very prominent. And of course, your first guess would be, well, they're being produced by these uh, multiple vortices, aren't they? Well, actually, in Dave Llewellyn's simulations, they're not. Now, the cycloidal marks result from deposited debris when the low-level inflow turns upward in the corner region in the updraft annulus of the tornado core. Now, I know that's a mouthful, so rather than trying to explain it in words, in terms of what Dave is saying here, let me try to explain it in a schematic model, which I think I always believe a picture is worth a thousand words. So let's move on. And what did Dave Llewellyn mean? Before that, let me remind you of Fujita's model. Uh, this is the one that's been around for 50 years in, in, in many textbooks, probably even in some weather service memos. The suction vortices, the suction vortices producing the, the, the debris swaths. So what is Dave Llewellyn saying that's different. Uh, Dave Llewellyn actually did this with his graduate student, Mike Zimmerman. So one subtle thing, he calls them, he prefers to call them secondary vortices and not suction vortices. And I can come back to that in just a second. Look at the debris swaths. Um, this is what he meant by they're being produced by convergence along the updraft annulus at the tornado core. He's proposing that it's unrelated to the secondary vortices. So all those marks you saw in a simulation on the previous slides are being produced by what is shown here in the schematic model. Uh, what's interesting is in his simulations, he does produce secondary vortices, but they, aren't the re they, they are a secondary uh, uh, mechanism to produce these debris swaths. The primary mechanism is what's shown here. And in fact, he simulated tornadoes with no secondary vortices, yet he still gets cycloidal debris swaths produced by the mechanism shown in this figure. So this is a major finding. The only reason why this Dave Llewellyn's model hasn't gotten more publicity, basically, is because we've never had the observations that suggested that what Dave was proposing seemed to be reality. And let me go in a little bit more detail. This is the photograph I showed you earlier, which was exactly at the time these cycloidal debris swaths are being produced. Now, it's possible that Smaller scale secondary vortices are in the are embedded in the funnel, but I can, all I can go on is on this picture, and there is no evidence that there are secondary vortices in tornado number one from Dodd City. The other, maybe a little bit more persuasive um, justification for the absence of this relationship between uh, secondary vortices and debris swaths is this 
the uh, Doppler velocity image. There's no doubt that you see the primary rotational couplet associated with the tornado. But through all the multitude of scans through this tornado during this time, there never was once a hint of a smaller scale rotational couplet, one or two or three or any. We just see this prominent rotational couplet associated with tornado one, which suggests that that's all there is there. There are no uh, mini rotational uh, vortices or mini rotational couplets. So I will tell you that since Ted Fujita was my advisor, it gives me great pain to go back and say that maybe his model for producing these cycloidal swaths may be an error. Uh, and and uh, that does pain me quite a bit. But I, I, I think the evidence has started becoming overwhelming that that may indeed be the case. I uh, can't help, as I sort of wrap up this presentation, to show you uh, Dave Llewellyn's simulations. They're, they're just re kind of jaw-dropping. Again, he, he does the most re realistic tornado simulations. These are debris swaths being created. Uh, they're very prominent. They very, very much look like what we see in damage surveys. However, they're not being produced by secondary vortices. And by the way, the reason why he prefers secondary vortices, which I, I tend to agree, for one thing, we now are seemingly suggesting here that uh, these sec uh, secondary vortices aren't producing a suction process to, to create cycloidal debris swaths. So the original reason that Fujita proposed that they call suction vortices is sort of dissipated. Uh, the other reason is he, he thinks, you know, he knows that, the, and, I, and you know too, that these are produced by instabilities around the tornado core. And so for that reason, he says, you know, suction vortices is just a misnomer. That, that, that doesn't describe why they're being produced. So my very last thing I will show you on my VN slide, because I, I know Jeremy wanted me to show something about this past spring. And for those that uh, uh, know that the big event for at least us was the Selden tornado on May 24th. So I'll just show you a video that I started looking at, uh, produced by uh, or recorded by Trey Greenwood. Um, Quite a bit of debris kicked up. It's one of the better movies while a radar is scanning of sort of the lofted debris and pieces of debris being lofted by this tornado. So I think I, I hopefully I didn't go too fast. I, I hope I left lots of time for questions. So I'll defer to, I don't know, Jeremy, are you sort of monitoring the question Q&A period or what? Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, I, we can go ahead and open the, the floor up now if anyone has any questions. Um, you can unmute yourself, and if you're having issues, just raise your hand or put something in the questions, and I'll see if I can get you unmuted. Um, thanks for posting a Selden video. Uh, I uh, it was kind of nice to see. I've, I've actually surprisingly didn't see too many pictures from that because when we went out for the survey, I wanted to. Whenever I survey for some reason, I, I try not to see the pictures first because I want to just find the damage. And uh, I know this was a uh, it was quite an interesting event for all the people in town there. Thankfully, I just drove through Selden a couple days ago. And yeah, you can't you can't tell anything happened there anymore. So they got recovered nicely. Excellent, excellent. So maybe I'll try to turn on my webcam if I can. So I don't look. Can you see me? I cannot. Um, okay. Well, it doesn't matter. I yeah, guess I can it, see yeah. it. Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Oh, so far there. away. <laughs> I'm I'm interested in any questions. Hey, hi, Dr. Wakamona. This is uh, Ed Holicky, the, the MIC out here in Goodland. How are you doing? Oh, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say see you. I don't see you, but good, good yeah. to hear from you. Yeah, great to hear from you again. It was a pleasure meeting you uh, in May uh, when you came out to our office. Uh, just a quick question on, on related to Selden. Uh, when do you think you might be able to get the uh, data from the Selden uh, tornado, uh, make it available for maybe some others to take a look at that? Yeah, so you know, that, that uh, is being a... a basically cleaned up by Howie Bluestein, and, and that's still ongoing. And so really, it's, it's sort of dependent on Howie and his students for, for cleaning up the data, unfolding it, uh, and then um, I'm sure it'll be available. I don't even have a copy of it yet. Okay, great. Yeah, again, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you uh, are doing this uh, for the High Plains chapter, and uh, it was a pleasure meeting you. And our, I can tell you that our office is looking forward to uh, getting that data and looking at the data. Great. Yeah. No, one of the, by the way, one of the fortunate things, as you know, it wasn't that strong of a tornado. Uh, had it been strong, uh, we might have gotten a much different result in Selden. 
Yep. Uh, again, thank you very much. Am I truly hearing dead silence? Seems like everyone's kind of shy to ask questions at first. So, um. <laughs> this is John. This is John uh, Stopcotty. I'm the Sioux up here in North Platte. I'll jump in. Jeremy knows I'm not too shy. Um, didn't know Dr. Uh, Fujita, but I was a kid in Grand Island, Nebraska, back in 1980. Uh, so very familiar with his work on that tornado. I'm just curious. There tends to be a few people in the Weather Service that um, tend to make a lot of what they see on the 88D with respect to uh, the TDS and, and debris lofting, specifically, in order to maybe change the messaging component. I, I just wonder what you kind of think about that. And based on the uh, temporal scale we get 88D from, compared to what you're seeing, um, you know, drastically different, obviously. Yeah. Um, by the way, first off, the Grand Island case, I, I surveyed that, those tornadoes. So uh, you, you just struck a memory cord with me. Uh, Ted, was actually was... Out of, Ted was out of town during that time, so I went out and surveyed those tornadoes. So, and then I all brought, right, okay. brought all the images back and my survey maps back, and then Ted started working on it with me. So anyway, I just thought that that's just a footnote. It's awesome. As far as the, the TDS signature and the debris, yeah, I think we're still learning. Certainly I am. Uh, I think it's a wonderful tool. Uh, there's no question. But there, there's still a lot that we, we need to understand. I mean, I shared some new things about it with negative ZDR. I've seen low row HV signatures when I don't think the tornado is quite formed yet uh, because, you know, just the circulation is starting to ramp up and it starts lofting things. But uh, it's got to be a little careful to say, gee, the first time you see a small area of, of uh, low row HV that the tornado is actually formed. Um, and of course, as you know, when the tornado dissipates, you still get low row HV because the lofted debris is still sort of falling out. And so even after the tornado, well after the tornado dissipates, uh, you can still get that TDS type signature, at least with uh, row HV. So I think we're still in, in learning process of it. I, I think it's still a very powerful tool. And, and uh, that's one of the reasons why I've, I've been so fascinated about collecting data and trying to do damage surveys, co collect visual information about tornadoes so I could learn a little bit more about what, what, is, what is the relationship. Because uh, bottom line, that's at least my research. I try to do it such that all of you benefit from it because you learn a little bit more that you didn't know before. So that's, that's probably the best way I could answer your question. Yeah, this is fascinating stuff. I really appreciate this. Uh, any theory as to why uh, everything aligns in the vertical? Yeah, uh, I, I don't think it's too surprising. Well, it was surprising when I first saw it. But, but when you think about it a little bit, the, the ZDR, negative ZDR signature occurs most prominently close to the tornado axis. And you have to remember, very close to the tornado axis, it's you start getting more impact of the vertical motions, and, and you know the vertical motions are either up or down. And so I, I think debris tends to align with the wind. And so things like wheat stems and leaves, they're aligning with the vertical motions that we know occur. And it's not so much dominated by the, the rotational velocities because you're close to the center of the tornado. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, but I will end. That wasn't intuitively obvious to me until I started thinking about it a little bit. You know, John, you mentioned something with the uh, TDSs and stuff. I think I'm correct on this. I, I need to, I may have missed one, but I, I believe this storm was the first TDS we've ever had observable on our ADD since we've had dual pull. Um, oh, really? Yeah, thankfully most of our, you know, we've been kind of in a lull for tornadoes anyway. Um, but then the ones we did have generally didn't do any damage. But this was, this was the first. And the, amazing, we went, we went from having none to we had this one. And then two days later we had, I think, yeah, it was two days later, Bankelman and the one up by, uh, oh, Rollins County. I can't remember exactly where it was at. But um, so we went from having none to having a couple. Um, so we have a couple yeah. days. Well, of course, one of the things, w uh, WSR-88Ds are wonderful, but one of the things I've learned is these mobile radars get really close. 
just show you detail that unfortunately isn't replicated in, in the 88Ds. Yeah, I think, uh, I can't remember when I saw this. Some, someone did, a, I believe it was a Dora Vortex too, a comparison of what one of the DAOs was seeing versus what the ADAD was. And, you know, yeah. well, what fits in the two pixels of our radar was this, you know, this amazing reflectivity structure and all that stuff. So it's yeah. always kind of humbling to see the, the mobile mobile radar is just what we don't know when we're out here in operations, what's going on. Yes, yes, absolutely. Hey, this is uh, Roger Dunwich. I had a quick question. Sure. Hey, uh, first of all, like others, I, I appreciate the, it's always fascinating to hear research like this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was really fascinated when you showed like with the ZDR and, and kind of even going back to John's question, you know, the, the debris alignment. Um, and, and hopefully this isn't a, a silly question, but <clears throat> um, if, if you see, so you, you showed kind of those areas of the negative ZDR and then, and then in that schematic you showed that there were some where you know, you'd shaded where it was even not only negative, but even further negative. What, is there any research or any, any possibility that that from a, um, would suggest like a, more negative, the, the stronger the vertical motion, um, or is it just kind of it, it hits a point where it's really not going to go much more negative, um, I guess, just in the way, again, because of the alignment there. Um, well, so just no, uh, on that. yeah, no, it's not a silly question. I mean, it, I mean, it's a good question. Why, why are these pockets of very minimum ZDR are being produced? Uh, I mean, that is telling you something. It is telling you that those are where perhaps the bigger, biggest, in the case of leaves or whatever, the, the, or wheat stems, those are where the bigger stems or leaves are located. And, and I think it's an interesting question to say, why are they congregating in that particular location? Uh, I don't have a good uh, feeling for that right now, and it could be just transient. You know, you know, maybe we'll try to see more in it than there is, because I mean, you can imagine they're going to be clumps of debris inside the tornado, and it could be just a transient feature, and there's nothing physically that that is explaining it. But there might be. Uh, but I don't. Uh, but that's really why that would occur, I think, and um, I don't have a good answer for it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we probably have time for one more question or so. Uh, anyone else have anything? If not, I guess you mentioned something uh, during your talk that you bring up about the enhanced Fujita scale. I guess we have some time. Do you want to? Well, the uh, story behind that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, again, I, I you can tell I gave you some history lessons, which you may or may not have been familiar with. So I'll give you a little history lesson on the, the EF scale. So, you know, I, obviously I was part of the, some of the discussions about changing or modifying or upgrading the F scale, whatever you want to call it. And then after that, those discussions, uh, we, we started to say, well, what do we call it? And, and actually it was, I was the one that said, why don't we call it the enhanced Vegeta scale? And, and people said, well, why do we want to call it that? And, and this is a true story. And, and I didn't know it was going to stick, but it, it did stick because we call it the Enhanced Vegeta Scale. But the reason, the reason why I proposed it is because for anybody that plays Scrabble, EF is pronounced F, right? That's how you, that's how you uh, spell out the, the letter F. And so my argument was even though it was EF, you'd still pronounce it F scale. And so Vegeta would still be honored. We wouldn't lose the, the F that meant Vegeta. So that's a very subtle detail, but true story, and, and it's gotten lost. Um, maybe I should have written something up about it at the time that, that we were talking about it at the workshop. So I don't know if that's kind of an amusing side story, but, it, but it's a true story. Oh, that's neat. That's, it, does, it does make me smile a little bit there. And I, will feel, I won't feel as bad if I forget to say the E in front of it now, because that's how it's supposed to be pronounced. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I said. If you know, if you do Scrabble, uh, that that's how you that's how you spell out the letter F, E F. Uh, that's good to know too, because I've been uh, I tried to learn Scrabble this winter, and my my daughter kept beating me really bad. So maybe this will help me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was, this was an excellent talk, Dr. Wakamoto, and uh, an honor to have you speak with us. Um, well, was I, 
I was going to mention something beforehand. Um, it's weird that you, I don't know if any of you guys have a paper you remember reading first, but I, re I still remember your non-supercell tornado paper. <laughs> I, I love land spots and sort of things, and I just that was a paper that really resonated with me. So it, it's great to get to talk to you. Um, oh, thank you very much. By the way, that non-supercell tornado, that was the first time people seriously talked about tornadoes building up from the ground rather than descending. Uh, and, and so I, I guess I, I was partially uh, attributed to turning the tornado world upside down. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it, the more they learn, the more that, that's, it's amazing how it's, I remember very briefly when I was getting started, that was kind of a new new thing. You know, the tornadoes might come from the ground up, but now it seems like, yeah, that's kind of, <laughs> that's how it happens. Yeah, maybe the, maybe the message I'll leave you as we, as we end this is there's, there's so much we don't understand, so. Never feel, even even after I make a presentation, that we figured it all out. There's still lots of questions out there. That is true. Well, thanks again for your time. Uh, it's an excellent talk, and for your willingness to talk to all of us. Okay. Um, I hope the meeting was a success, and it was a real pleasure uh, being here, and I hope to meet a lot of you face-to-face. -face. I hope so, too. Um, yeah, I, I, hope, I hope everyone found the meeting was successful. I know we want to I can't wait to meet in person again. Um, thanks to everyone for making this this possible and, and and going with it. You know, it wasn't optimal, but this is what we could do. Um, I believe if we can get back to normal next year, the next High Plains conference will be in North Platte. Um, I know John's been kind of waiting to get his going, and we've had to call it off two years in a row. Um, oops, got a question popped up here real quick. Oh, someone said excellent presentation. So. Okay. That was a compliment for you, Dr. Wakamoto. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, okay. I'm going to log off. All right. You have a good day. You too.